Mayo Clinic presents the Always On EM podcast, hosted by Alex Finch and Frank Bellamconda. Hello, and welcome to the Always On EM podcast. My name is Venk Bellamconda. Alex Finch and I are grateful to be your hosts of this show. Usually in the mid-month episode is a Grand Rounds recording, but this month is different. You could say we are interrupting your supply, but it's for a very good reason. Some of you may recall that Dr. Pratish Tosh had joined us in the middle of the pandemic to talk through COVID-19, as he is an infectious disease specialist here at Mayo Clinic. He's an outstanding clinician and has talents for the microbial world that are really top-notch, of course. Yet his talents don't end there. He approached Alex and I about a year ago to have us consider a show about supply chain management. I must say, when he first did this, I was a bit nervous about how relevant this would be for you, for our listeners. So I would not blame any of you for wondering the same. Let me assure you that after sitting down and talking with him about this, Alex and I have zero doubt about how important this topic is. Tom Krischer and Tassini Vejponsa reported through the Associated Press on October 1st, 2024, so just two weeks ago, that dock workers at ports throughout the United States began a strike over wages and to rally against automation as a threat to their jobs. This represents about 45,000 members of the International Longshoremen's Association, and they had their contracts expire at midnight that night. Although their direct impact is to the 36 ports of entry, primarily, primarily affecting the eastern seaboard of the United States and the Gulf of Mexico, the ripple effect was estimated to potentially cost the economy about $4 billion per day of the strike, according to J.P. Morgan. Thankfully, the strike was suspended after a couple days because a tentative agreement was reached. Days is much better than the last time this happened, which was 1977, and the East Coast and Gulf Coast longshoremen work stoppage lasted almost two months that time. In addition, a Category 4 hurricane, Hurricane Helene, came up from the Gulf of Mexico and on Friday, September 27th, devastated North Carolina. In addition to the direct damage to the, and hardship to, that this caused to the people of North Carolina, Berkeley Lovelance Jr. and Mustafa Fatah from NBC News reported that Baxter International, a medical supply company responsible for preparing most of the IV crystalloid used in the U.S. hospitals, had to shut down its Carolina-based facility because of flooding. At least it's a temporary closure. At least that's what's expected. We all have a sense of how much supply of IV fluids we consume in healthcare in the United States, but I'd like to put some numbers to that gestalt. In 2013, the New England Journal of Medicine reported over 200 million liters of saline were prescribed in the U.S. alone, and I'm sure that number has only increased since then. You can imagine these kinds of events, strikes, weather-related disasters, etc., and more threaten our supply chain of the equipment, medicines, and supplies we need to deliver healthcare in today's world. Dr. Tosh, a truly world expert in the understanding of supply chain management to protect the care care delivery system. In fact, he was recently requested at the White House for for this purpose as well. In this spirit, stay tuned. I promise this will be an eye-opening discussion about a topic we know very little about with a person who is a gifted strategist on the issue. This will help you to have masks during the next pandemic, understand what is happening with IV fluids, and to be able to strategize for when there is a shortage of your favorite antidysrhythmic medication. With this, let's jump right into the discussion with Dr. Pratish Tosh, consultant in infectious diseases here at Mayo Clinic, as well as master of the supply chain. He is a full professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic, has achieved master's faculty privileges in clinical and translational science. He's worked for the CDC, received awards for his clinical skills, teaching abilities, and his commitment to safety and operations in many forms, including several Teacher of the Year recognitions from a variety of sources, including the Mayo Clinic Fellows Association, Mayo Medical School, 
his Infectious Disease Fellowship Program, and others. He's received a commendation for his service to the U.S. Public Health by the U.S. Public Health Service and much more. The conversation you're about to hear is from January 29th of this year, so it's nearing about a year old. At the time, he had recently published an article, Medical Supply Shortages, We Are Part of the Problem and the Solution, in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in December 2023. Alex and I would love to hear your thoughts on this topic after you listen, so please reach out to us at alwaysonem at gmail.com or via Instagram at alwaysonem. Like and follow the show, as you know we request every time on whatever platform you're using. So go ahead and grab something to drink, but maybe save the ringer's lactate for your patients. And we're going to jump into the conversation right now. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you back, Dr. Tosh. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. This is exciting every time. This is a very exciting topic. It's something that I previously, until this paper, have not thought a lot about. I got to tell you. I used to give a lot of talks on supply chain vulnerability and like pre-pandemic, it'd be like an empty room, just like me and some supply chain guys and that's it. <laughs> and then like then everyone's experiencing like what shortages mean. Yeah. And then you know, post-pandemic, it's a totally different story and people are actually really interested and receptive to what all the uh, nerds in the room were saying for years. I hope I didn't give too much of a vacant stare when you pulled me aside at the soccer field to talk about this, but I have since converted to the light side, I will say, not the dark side. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's often a tough pitch, which is actually the the issue we're dealing with. No one wants to think about this stuff, but it's it's very impactful, and and in medicine has been really hitting us hard, and it's going to hit us even harder. How did you fall into this work? Most of the audience probably has not been, you know, rifling through my garbage and don't know my life. But I always wanted a career in risk management. And of course, I went through the infectious diseases, but I worked at uh, CDC in the Epidemic Intelligence Service after my ID fellowship. And then I came back to Mayo and they're like, you need to do a little bit more. And then I worked with Mike Osterholm at the University of Minnesota for three years as a Mayo Clinic scholar. And with Mike, I learned about big picture stuff, including global supply chain vulnerability and just how all this stuff stuff relates to each other and big picture stuff about uh, healthcare and you know and healthcare preparedness i think we usually start with a case and it's usually a specific case about a specific scenario but i think that the case in this circumstance is something that we've all lived recently which is the last time i had a patient who needed something and i call for it and somebody tells me that we have to use something alternative because that's on back order or we're lacking that at the hospital. Vink, have you had any circumstances of that recently? Well, I I heard recently that somebody was trying to give continuous albuterol and they were told that albuterol is on a shortage. So they were asked to use boluses of that and then consider if they could do something else as well. And it, it got me thinking, especially in prep for this talk, What is the situation on drug shortages right now? And so as of January 10th, the FDA was tracking 124 active drug shortages. Albuterol was, of course, on that list. And that's staggering to me. Yeah, and it's not getting better. It's getting worse. Not just within pharma. You look at medical supplies as well. If things are indeed getting worse, you're not imagining it. And there's patient impact. You looked at, there. I think, I want to say it was New England Journal or JAMA, looked at the impact of the epinephrine shortage, right? So when you start looking at critical illness, right, you can really measure the impact. And there was a mortality difference when you're using sort of your non-preferred drug. You know, we'll try to look at the propofol shortage. Now you're looking at increased use of benzos and increased- Ketamine. Ketamine. (laughs) (laughs) Our audience loves ketamine, I'm sure. So if propofol is shortage, you're, they're going for ketamine. My, my son had required some, some ketamine in your ER with what? a lack, and uh, oh. he went into the K-hole. The K-hole, yeah, is yeah. that it? That is. It's what well, is that? The description of going into the K-hole, it's, the that means it is the dissociated state. I've never heard that term. Yes. But I hate ketamine. <laughs> I, I'm the only EM doc probably in the world that hates ketamine, but okay. But I, I, I guess I'm the K-hole. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love that you talk about more than medications, though, because it is, it's a very visceral thing. The belly of the pandemic f- feels almost distant at this point, but I don't know how it was 
in your emergency department for our listeners, but for us, we were very lucky. We had a reliable reliable supply chain for the most part, but what would happen, I'd get a mask given to me at the beginning of my shift in, in control, and that was my mask for the day that I would wear. And I realize in, in many places, people were getting their own PPE, but you know, I remember like I'd, I'd wear this one, that I got this one for the day. That's what I had. And, you know, I think about going to the store or something and masks weren't available anywhere else. And so, I, you know, you try and save your one little mask and it was stressful. And remember the collection buckets. Yep. After at the end of the yes, shift. Yes, you would put the mask in the collection bu- bucket because it was potentially going to be reused. And that was an in- intense thing. And I, the N95s we reused Many yep. times. You had many a shifts. box, yep. and we learned how to fold the N95 into the box without touching it because we would use that. Yeah, you're bringing it up, and it's like this memory that I put away. So, to that end, this is a little bit of a tangent, but we had to train people on how to properly don oh, no. and doff this stuff. And Alex was the featured person in these videos in a series called Stop Finch. (laughs) (laughs) So we made a series of videos of a bumbling Alex Finch, like (laughs) going into a code. So, you know, we would run these codes in these negative pressure rooms and I would go in incorrectly and they would have to stop the whole resuscitation because I had contaminated myself and everyone. And And it was called Stop Stop Finch. Finch. And and so, but like for years afterwards, it's like I go into recess and people are like, Stop Finch. And and so that's that's the persona I've set for myself. Did I ever tell you guys why we had enough N995s? No, No, I want to hear. Again, there's very few papers that I'm really proud of. So uh, I want to say it was 2016, 2017. We did... A Monte Carlo simulation of different influenza pandemics. This Wait. is all I can imagine at the time. And looking at well, staff space and stuff, what do we run out of first, right? Yeah. And so just to clarify, the ID doc, when you said staff, you mean people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Personnel, right. personnel. But staff space and stuff starts with an S, right? right. Yeah. And we figured out that very quickly we would run out of N95 masks. And so we started stockpiling them. So we actually, as an organization, we had enough N95s to go until the global supply chain was able to keep up. That's amazing. And looking at your papers, you published even in, I think it was CHEST, well before this recent pandemic about the importance of this. And so I I feel really grateful that you've been watching over us. We didn't know it. And we lived through... (laughs) the safety net that you built for us. I appreciate that. And this is, gets back to the empty rooms that I was talking to for years. Yeah. And that's okay. I'm glad sort of people recognize it now. You know, I think one of the really big ones was Hurricane Maria, hmm. right? Because it took out Puerto Rico, where so many IV fluids were being made, right? Suddenly we didn't have IV fluids, right? right? So it was kind of standard thing is IV fluid, right? right. And Uh, just how much that impacted people. And it's not like Puerto Rico is on the other side of the world. This is a U.S. territory in our backyard, and we didn't know that this was going to happen. Right. So suddenly we were out of IV fluids, and we're trying to react. And so is the focus of your publication and what we're talking about today about reacting? No, and that's a great point. The bang is when uh, the shortage happens. And a lot of publications, a lot of people focus their energy on sort of what happens after the bang. We're emergency doc. Right. We're, so we know. are, we're at the bang. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's all right of the bang. And for me, I want to be left of the bang. How do we get into this mess? Right. And then how do we get out of it? And it turns out that we are responsible, like as purchasers, because over decades, you try to squeeze money where you can, right? You've got patient improvement, got you know, lots of healthcare innovation. And so like, oh, let's just, instead of paying, I'll just say 25 cents for this glove, what if we spent 23 cents? And then a manufacturer is like, sure, we can do that. What they don't tell you is what it takes to make this product for less money, right? Now you're looking at increased vulnerability, offshore, and less reliable, you know, more vulnerable raw materials, all this sort of stuff. So it it happens slowly over time that the economic incentives are purely for the price tag. Whereas if 
the entire time somebody saw that this life-saving widget mm -hmm. that we used to pay $25 for is now $10. But that cost came at the reliability of that product, that when we needed it, it was not there. And we created the situation. I want to dig in because I think I'm almost there. I think a capitalist sitting at the table to the left of me would say, cheaper prices are better for the consumer. Healthcare expenses are huge right now. Are we saying that moving our production of, we're talking about widgets, let's make it real. Let's say albuterol. Or, you know, we were talking about albuterol earlier. So albuterol being produced in a factory in Ohio is better than in a factory somewhere else, does that make it more stable for us? So not necessarily. So okay. a lot of people are focused on domestic manufacturing. I'm okay. not sure that's the right answer. Okay. It's not the totality of the answer, right? So, so what is it about buying the more expensive product that makes it less likely that when I order it, it's not there? What it's are we not talking? so much that it should be the more expensive product. Okay. It's that when you are buying solely on price, mm -hmm. that is what is going to be optimized. Okay. Whereas you, know, you want to buy lemon olive oil mm. on Amazon, okay. right? And you can look, see like 100 different lemon olive oils and different price points. Right. But what's nice about Amazon is that you have the ratings. Like you, are you going to okay. buy something that's cheaper mm -hmm. that has a one star where like 500 people said, this tastes terrible? Or are you going to buy something that's maybe slightly more expensive, reasonably priced, but much higher rated. So the idea of just having that other data point influences your purchasing behavior. I think that's really thoughtful. And I notice a lot of times when there's reviews, and even in review videos on YouTube, people will talk about not only unboxing, but did it come on time when the manufacturer said it would? So. You know, I ordered it. They said it was going to be this shipping. They did or did not meet that promise. And even on Amazon, where theoretically Amazon is usually doing the fulfilling, they incorporate that into the review because the purchaser is evaluating the experience as a whole. And that's what you're talking about. Did I get a reliable product? And did I get it when it was supposed to come? And that's a little bit what we're talking about is the entire experience, not just the actual albuterol. Right. And so those are the key performance indicators of when I ordered it, how much showed up, was it on time, right? That's important. But there's also the aspect of before that, like how resilient is the supply chain of that product? And that's more opaque. What and does that even mean? I mean, I think about resilience and I think a lot about EM. We're talking about burnout. We're talking about what qualities are involved in grit. And it seems different. What does what supply chain resilience mean? It's, it's a similar concept, okay. right? So when there are external stressors to different parts of the chain that takes it from a raw material to a finished good that is delivered to your facility, okay. there's a lot of things that can happen in between. Mm -hmm. How resilient is that supply chain to disruption based on external okay. stresses? And okay. that might be a, a UPS strike. It yeah. might be an issue at the uh, mining site of the raw material or whatever. Mm -hmm. How much resilient, how much resiliency does that supply chain have to make sure that if you order something, like it's going to be there? That's a really incredible concept. <clears throat> so what we're saying is it's potentially could be a little bit more expensive to include some redundancy in the manufacturing process. And we should be looking for that when we pick the product is their ability to tolerate even minor external forces to keep the product showing up. That's part of it. Okay. And you also have to recognize that when you have a shortage, it costs your organization a lot of money because it costs you more to, one, if you're trying to source some other product, right? Now that product is more expensive and you also have to spend a lot of manpower to source that product. So there's the amount of time and energy it takes to respond to a shortage, if you just spent a fraction of that money on a product that was more resilient to begin with, you would have saved a ton of money. Wow, I didn't think about that. There's this South African phrase, and I, I'm gonna butcher it, but essentially it means that a cheap buy is an expensive buy. Meaning that if you buy something 
like a truly a, a cheap thing, in the end, it's going to cost you more money. And that's what I'm saying with uh, how we're purchasing medical goods, that if you go on price alone, you're going to end up spending more money. And what I'm looking for is to increase the additional data point to be beyond just price, that people should be able to see price and some aspect of resiliency. If I'm hearing this correctly, the other thing is that that data point would then put an economic pressure on the supply chain to focus and optimize resiliency. That's right. So an example is there's a nonprofit organization, the Healthcare Industry Resilience Collaborative, that began a few years ago, but really grew in its organization during the pandemic with a bunch of healthcare organizations, major ones, and purchasers and suppliers, and really realizing that what we're currently doing is benefiting nobody. And what if we were to fix this? And so Healthcare Industry Resilience Collaborative, HERC, has now come up with a badging system where essentially through an audit like th- of this product, is it a resilient product? If so, it gets the badge. Yeah. And so if you are looking at a badge product versus a non-badge product, and it's a reasonably similar price, you're going to pick out the badge product. Absolutely. And so that should drive the sort of economically for other manufacturers to want to have a more resilient supply chain. In your recent publication in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, you highlighted a few other pieces to resilience. It's not just the ability to sustain the flow, but I loved how you also talked about prediction of disruption. Can you elaborate a little bit on that piece? Sure. And so A lot of the supply chain for different products is completely opaque to the consumer. And of course, some of that's necessary so that these companies can have uh, a competitive advantage, right? But they can now, with increased analytics, right? If you know that you have a, a bottleneck near Iceland and there's like a volcanic eruption, like well, what's the chances of a volcanic eruption is Iceland, right? Well, that's actually pretty good, yeah. right? And so understanding a little bit more of that. So we used to, even if we knew that 20 years ago, we couldn't do anything with it, right? But now we have the analytic ability to layer on all of this data about supply chain and you know, geographic issues and like natural disaster issues and, and political instability and all this stuff layered on top of each other and really have an understanding of, wow, how vulnerable is this? And what's the likelihood we're going to run into shortage based on this kind of supply chain? And the natural question, I would assume, if I was the supplier of albuterol or, as in our case, a consumer of face masks was, how do you create a just-in-time capacity to be ready for when those disruptions, the volcano happens, et cetera? And what's your take on that and its role here? Yeah. If you have a vulnerable supply chain and you need that product, your options are going to be either to withstand a shortage and just deal with it or try to stockpile. And the stockpile cost itself is substantial, right? Yeah. You know, they take space and you have, and you know, space is valuable and you have to maintain it. That's not a cheap option either. Whereas I think the long-term solution really is to fortify and make the broader medical supply chain uh, more resilient. And that's through, honestly, the right economic incentives of towards resiliency and not just towards vulnerability. So brief summary time. In your incredible paper, you define resiliency in this supply chain as the ability to sustain continuous flow of goods during both normal and abnormal conditions. Number two, it is the capacity to predict, prevent, and recover from disruption. And number three, it requires just-in-case capacity and preparedness. So continuous flow in goods during normal and abnormal conditions means building into the supply chain a function to overcome that. It's the capacity to predict, prevent, and recover from disruption. So even if it's a little bit more expensive, potentially, saying we see that there's the potential for a volcano and we have a plan for what we're going to do in that circumstance. And then just in case capacity is either stockpiling or having an alternate production scheme in place 
for it if you really need it. Essentially, yes. Okay. That's so helpful because I think I was challenging to even define resilience in this context, and that's really helpful. And along our conversation also, Alex, he was talking about some of the factors that are creating these vulnerabilities. And he talked, if I'm hearing correctly, about the economic incentives. We talked a lot about the lack of transparency in the system. In the paper, you touched on the complexity of manufacturing of our current equipment and goods. And and I'd love to hear more about that and how that plays into our vulnerability. Yeah. Have you ever done the, the birthday... Uh, uh, are you familiar with the birthday paradox? No. Okay. I don't if think you so. have, I want to say, 25 people in a room and you uh, ask them their birthday, it's actually a 50% chance that two people will share a birthday. Really? Yeah. Just uh, like just really just like 25 down to the people. date. No, I mean, not the year, but right. like the, the day. The day. Wow. It seems bizarre, right? Yeah. I would. But 25 people represents a relatively complex system. Right. So it's not just the chances that you and I don't sh- or share a birthday, but it's also you and I or you and I or YouTube. Now you're spreading 25. That becomes an incredibly complex system hmm. where seemingly improbable odds become increasingly inevitable with the complexity of the system. In fact, at like 37 people, in a room, it's like a 90 plus percent chance that two people share a birthday. So I'm following you so far. So there's so many interactions when we have that many people that the chance of having identical birthdays goes up quite high. Right. How does that translate to the complexity of our manufacturing yeah. now? So rarely is the place where you get the raw materials the place where the place the, the thing is manufactured. Mm-hmm. And rarely is where the place where it's manufactured, the eventually the packaging and eventually delivery. And so that brings in a lot of variables, geographic variables, people variables, into what may have been a more simple process. But now we've made it far more complicated because we've added additional points. This is where it's manufactured. This is our delivery point. This is the packaging. This is the raw material. And of course, none of those are in the the same place. So we, we make it increasingly complicated so that it becomes increasingly more vulnerable because you just added more points where things could go wrong. Volcanoes, political unrest. Yes. I got it. Okay. Hurricanes. Remember the Beijing Olympics? Yeah. So have you been to Beijing? No, I want to go. Apparently fairly smoggy. Uh, Tough to have visibility. No one wanted to have an Olympics like that. And so before the Olympics, the Beijing Olympics, they shut down, let's say, all factories within 100 kilometers of Beijing, right? Clear the air, including a factory that made nitrile gloves. Oh. So there was suddenly a shortage of nitrile gloves, not because of a hurricane, not because of political unrest, but because of a sporting event. This is where you know, increasingly complex systems become inevitably flawed. I'm just reflecting on the fact every time I try and pull out one glove from the box... Three like, fall out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, and, it's the ejection button. It's like they, they shoot out at you, and then and then it's super awkward because it's like the patients, you can't They're put watching back. you yeah. on the floor. <laughs> like that, like, it's, yeah, it's... Oh, this is for my third hand. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate that we share that dilemma. Oh, yeah. Or you have to use two hands. Pull one out as you yeah. push the hoard back in. Oh. I'm just wondering what would happen to the nitrile glove supply and demand relationship if we could fix the <laughs> withdrawal losses that occur just from pulling out a glove. Absolutely. I like to take small gloves and put it in the medium box. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> That's a joke for it, everyone. It actually, I, I'm not going to lie, so we have them in a very specific order, and every now and then in one room, it's different. And nothing makes me look worse in front of a patient than when I confidently walk in and I pull out my size glove and it's like a tiny glove and I'm but at that point I've committed like I like it, I've got to try and get this tiny glove on my hand and no it's a mess when yeah. I rip the glove that way I usually just say ah, I'm happy to be growing from the last room <laughs> and I love it throw it away but I can see this and I think there's sort of I would say you, you brought up this great knowledge I'm going to buy the higher quality thing and I'm going to get more value but there was something in your paper that I wasn't aware of and made me 
concerned. It said half of U.S. hospitals are running negative margins. And this is going to be something that many EDs are not immune to. We, I think the biggest honor we have is we are, we are a place that anyone can go, whether they can pay or not. And sometimes we have to watch our bottom line carefully. How do you demonstrate value for something like this? If, if we're going to pick the more expensive glove, how do we show that? And that is work that I'm doing and we are work that we are doing, right? So it's one thing to say theoretically, yeah, right? If you pick the more resilient product, you're going to have it. And in the long run, it's going to be cheaper. I want to prove that on two ends. One, that it causes clinical outcome issues, right? So we know that for epinephrine, but what if we looked at it for a bunch of other products? And that's something I'm working on. Yeah. And the other piece is economically. Like this is okay. an economic decision that led us into this position that we're in. People thought they were saving money, but in the long run, likely increasing their expenditures. But I need to prove that, Yeah. right? Because it's not just the cost of the alternative product, right? Mm -hmm. It's all of the manpower that it takes to you know, source something else. If you think about TPN, do you remember the TPN shortage? No. Man, like th these are finicky. And so if people have spent hours and hours just learning about these different options and how do we formulate this. And so uh, had we just spent a little bit more on a known resilient product, we could have saved ourselves a whole lot of headache and a lot of money. But I need to prove that. But I think at the bedside, we feel what it is to lose a product that we need all the time and have to MacGyver or something else. Like, I know what it is like to not have the kit that I need. And, you know, we, we've talked about a couple of things here. Albuterol, I have to come up with an alternative. The other day, there was a discussion that I believe Ativan needed a special approval to do IV. And... When I'm in a situation, frankly, and I'm trying to figure out an alternative to a B-52, I'm already under a lot of stress. The chance that I'm going to make an error is much higher. And, and I can't imagine any bedside clinician saying, I wouldn't want a reliable product. Like, this is what I need in this moment of great stress. I don't know, Venk, what do you think? I think you articulated it beautifully. Uh, we don't use B-52s very often, just correct, for Correct, correct. It isn't a common thing, and, and we have We're alternate not advocating pathways. For that, but, but I just mean under... But decisions, when you're already making a ton of other decisions, is not the ideal time to do this. Anyway. And to be doing something that potentially you're less comfortable with. Right. A, a medication that I don't feel as comfortable with the dosing, something like that. And one situation I've encountered this a lot where the supply is changing on me a lot is when I play central lines. I feel like... In my time here, I've seen several iterations of our central line equipment kits. And a lot of times I'll open it up and I have to ask the respiratory therapist who is watching all of the central lines go in, what is this thing for? Or this is different than the last bio sponge that I was used to and things like that. And that might be a factor of being in emergency medicine where we're not involved in some of these decisions. But can you speak to how other specialties might interact with the supply chain as differently than us? Yeah, and having worked with the supply chain folks for a while now, they are very much aware, and have been for a long time, that the supply chain, medical supply chain, is becoming more and more vulnerable. But what I keep hearing is that, well, I brought this up, and here are two products, and I suggested that we pick the more resilient product, but in the end, the doctor wanted to go with what they already knew, and they are more familiar with, and so we ended up just doing what we usually do, which is buying the cheaper product, which was less resilient. So what I want people who are listening to this to recognize that the supply chain folks are actually thinking about this from a, a big picture and sort of the long term. And you know, think about, well, not just am I most familiar with this, but, in the, that, but there's a big picture here, right? And that if you try something perhaps new that is in the long run better, it may be a little uncomfortable up front, but in the, in the end, I think it's valuable. Now, there's going to be also physicians who are involved in you know, higher leadership of their organization or in broader supply chain purchases. And those folks really need to understand that we are in a real mess here. And we created it. Like, we are creating the economic incentive for a vulnerable supply chain. And we can fix that just by asking a few questions. Like, oh, I would prefer a reasonably priced product that is more reliable than a cheaper product uh, that is less reliable. 
I'm thinking about that email that you were talking where the supply chain folks might reach out to a doc asking for preference. I've never received such an email. And I think that might be a factor of my specialty, that we're on the receiving end of decisions that a lot of other people are making. But I bet there are specialists and specialties where they have more influence. Give us insight into what that looks like. And as an infectious diseases doctor, I don't get any of these either. But when talking to our supply chain folks, that's actually the, the biggest thing that changes the actual purchasing behavior is there's a, there's a physician request. And that essentially supersedes any supply chain resiliency data. So for those who are in positions where the supply chain folks, hey, ask which, which of these would you prefer? All I ask is you ask, a little question about the resilience. And maybe you still end up doing the one that fits better into your practice. But if there's two that are the same, please pick the more resilient product. And that's it. And are we talking about an example of a very niche spine surgical practice? Or is this something that even like internists and cardiologists might be getting questions from a supply chain folks? So uh, eventually all products that are purchased in medicine Somebody has to approve those, and physicians are in some way involved with all of that. That makes sense. And so whatever the product is, asking just one more question. Yeah. And when the supply chain folks say, this one has you know, better resiliency, their supply chain is more, you know, more robust, please pay attention to that. And when there is a shortage of something that you really need, maybe that's the right time to also say, well, why did we pick this one? Is there another product that is more reliable? And did we look into that? And why didn't we pick this one? Yeah. I really like that. So for our different, Venk has brought, broken this down into a variety of different users. And there's the ED type user, to be honest, who I'm usually using the product that has been given to me. And when there's a shortage, it's okay for me to ask why. And is there an opportunity for us to prevent this from happening in the future? Even if it is a slightly more expensive product, maybe it would make things better for my patient. And so that's one type of user. I think I do think there's an option also. Frequently, the institution changes the type of product they use. So I think frequently with our airway equipment, there's one type of video laryngoscope, and then we're thinking about stocking another. And they'll, they'll bring it and they'll leave it by. And usually, I'm playing with the equipment and just feeling like a kid in a candy shop and thinking how cool the video is. But I should probably stop and ask a question, which is, hey, I'm being told that this laryngoscope is disposable and cheaper, and that would probably be a good thing. But what's the chance that, that this is going to run out and leave us with no video laryngoscope when I need it to intubate this patient and suddenly I'm doing DL? What a would, great point. Yeah. So we have those two options as the ED doc. And then there's the decider who we're asking them to just ask that question when they're deciding as well and say, hey, this, this price point, this one looks better, but does it have this stamp of Herc? Is that the right group? Yeah, and there's a, uh, that's there's being a couple, piloted. But, so, but there's the, a stamp or some marker of potential resiliency. And can we offer that? And if I'm the kind of physician who I get to demand my stuff, which sounds pretty darn cool. Yeah. And I'm offered an alternative product. Consider it and consider is resiliency being offered as a function of, of that offer as well. That's exactly right. Okay. I like that summary. And while we're taking a moment to summarize, do you mind, uh, Pratish, going over the, the summary of the factors that affect the supply chain? Of course. And so underlying vulnerability, if you say <clears throat> there's five primary factors, one is the economic incentives and regulatory pressures that favor offshore centers of concentrated manufacturing. We talked about IV fluids in Puerto Rico. Two, increasingly complex manufacturing and logistics with reduced transparency. The birthday paradox, and it's increasingly complicated, and no one can see any of it. Right. Three, a lack of standards to define, measure, and incentivize resiliency in product sourcing. Four is the narrow margins for healthcare organizations and commodity manufacturers. So the folks who are buying it and the folks who are selling it. And then excessive leaning of the medical supply chain and reduced resilience. So some of that we do to ourselves, yeah. right? We have fewer things in stock, a lot of just-in-time uh, inventory, which makes it harder for us to withstand an insult to the, to the supply chain. That's excellent. 
up to now we've been talking about before the bang. Yeah. Is there any thoughts and comments you have on what we've learned after the bang? One, we know it's really complicated and it's really expensive and we end up picking things that are suboptimal. And even if they say there are two products that perform the same in experienced hands, if you put those products in inexperienced hands, there's a different outcome, right? And so preferred products are preferred for a reason, and it might be preferred for, by one person more than another. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to truly prove that supply chain vulnerability results in poor patient outcomes. But I think providers feel it. They know it, like, oh, I don't have the product that I usually use or the one that I prefer. And I think bad things happen as a result. As an also a follow-up looking forward, do you have concerns about impact or threats to our supply chain in a global sense coming up that have you worried? All the time. And it's not anything specific. Okay. It is just how vulnerable the medical supply chain has become. And we have put us put ourselves here. And it's going to take a long time to unravel this. But my hope is we can we can get there with enough awareness that we had a, a hand in creating the economic incentives to make this as bad as it is. All right, but let's address some naysayers. Sure. Okay. We've talked about expense. Okay, we're going to buy the more expensive thing. There's downsides to that. We want to buy the more resilient. Thing. Okay. Yes. Okay. How about the expense of storing things? How would you address somebody who says having a ton of this sitting around may involve some waste? I, I I've read a couple of stories in the news about, you know, initially we didn't have any PPE and then states stocked up and then might have to auction some. How would you address that? So in general, I would far favor a more resilient supply chain than having people stockpile. Okay. Stockpile is like a necessary thing as a result of a vulnerable supply chain. Wow. I love it. So the, the stockpiling was the third part of the definition of resiliency. And that's like what we really shouldn't be doing, but we have to do as a result of. And that's not just us, the manufacturer, just having yeah. a little bit more on hand to weather the storm. If I had a choice between a more resilient supply chain and like more on hand just as a stockpile, I far prefer the more resilient supply wow. chain. Wow. I love that. And PPE yeah. is a sort of somewhat of a different beast. You know, an N95 mask is essentially a battery, and it only lasts for five years. And unfortunately, an N95 mask, outside of a respiratory pandemic, you don't use very many. And so it's the one that everyone remembers, mm -hmm. right, because it was very vivid. But it's a bit of an outlier when we're looking at supply chain vulnerabilities just because it's, it's so different. So in some cases, it's a necessary evil, but in most cases, we could probably overcome it if we had overcome the waste associated with stockpiling if we we had a more resilient system. Right. Wow. Taking a deeper dive on the N95 masks, can you peel back the curtain on what you did to stockpile these batteries Yeah. in leading up to the most recent pandemic? We looked at how much would be needed, and we looked at 10,000, we modeled 10,000 different influenza pandemics, and staff space and stuff, uh, what we would run out of first and realize, wow, we, are, we wouldn't last weeks with how many N95 we have. We have, And so I went to our practice and I said, you know, this is our data. I think if there is a respiratory pandemic, which is inevitable, you know, we'd be in really bad shape. And what I'm requesting is that we increase our PAR stock of N95s, recognizing most of it would either be wasted or missioned if we didn't have yeah, you know, a pandemic in five years, but we would be ready in case we did. And the, you know, f forethought of our practice leaders were like, "Yep, this makes sense." At, at quite a price tag, and it's uh, one of those things that I'm really proud to work at Mayo Clinic because of it. I mean, I can see a bunch of ID docs sharing that view, but it would be hard to convince. You know, when you have people who have multiple interests at stake and we're going to say, we're going to put the resources towards stockpiling this. Was there like a, a champagne moment when, you, when it was like, yes, 
I figured this out and now everyone's safe because of me. Did you like open a bottle of champagne? It was like, I saved all of these employees. Did anyone thank you or anything like that? I got a lot of thanks. Okay. Uh, good. Silent. Because I didn't know it was you. And so I'm saying thank you now because I, <laughs> I had no idea. And I just felt fortunate that I got my N95. I hate getting those kinds of accolades. I have to tell you that. Whether people knew it or not. Okay, I take my thanks back. Thank you. I, I really <laughs> don't want to hear it. I, 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 sadly, I just don't want to hear it. And um, I didn't feel great because I knew there's a lot of people elsewhere in the world who didn't have it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We published that paper. And anyone could have looked at it and did exactly what we That's did. That's the chest paper, right? No, it's a different paper. Oh, it was okay. American Journal of Infections and Control, I think. Okay. We talked about what we did and showed what we had and what, how much we'd need. And anyone could have looked at that paper and realized that they, too, would have run out of N95s very quickly. And I don't know how many people saw the paper and, and made some actual a- actions to make those uh, purchasing decisions to save their employees. I don't know if you're able to recall. What made you pick the respiratory pandemic as the model to test as opposed to something else? Because of influenza. Like, we know there's going to be another flu pandemic. Okay. That's why we modeled influenza instead of, like, coronaviruses or something. It's just we know that that's inevitable. Another flu pandemic is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that's why we picked influenza. We run simulations on, like, bridge collapse, airplane crash, stuff like that. And I feel like we test our system, not so much our equipment. What advice would you have for us to take that next step? and evaluate our supply chain of equipment for these major disasters? And should we be doing, or is that a wasted exercise? As a nation, as a community of of physicians, we collectively should have an understanding of what life-saving products are most vulnerable. That is something I think we collectively need to do. As data becomes more available as we are able to see a little bit more about the supply chain. But again, most of it is opaque. You can't actually see it. So it makes it really hard for people who don't have access to the data to be able to analyze and see what's vulnerable. I wish we were in a different position. Well, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. This has been awesome and a topic that we don't talk about very often, but we need to be. And I think as you highlighted, as we make decisions on our airway equipment and on our drug choices. And if people ask us from supply chain, which one do we prefer? We need to be thinking in addition to the price and the usability of the product, how resilient is that supply chain and looking for markers or gauges to assess that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you have it. We have supplied you with content that you're unlikely to hear in too many other places, and yet will affect everything you do, every shift, every day for the remainder of your career. Special thanks again to Dr. Pratish Tosh for speaking up and advocating for this topic and for his skill set. This highlights for me how valuable it has been in my life to have amazing colleagues that broaden my perspective on what is happening for our shared patients. He has been teaching me things since I was an intern physician, and I hope he taught you some stuff as well. Don't forget to like, comment, and follow the show on your podcasting platform of choice. Also, go to our YouTube channel, you guessed it, always on EM, to see some of the great discussions we had at ASEP with researchers and teams. Uh, We're trying to build this channel, so go check it out, help us out, help give us feedback on what you want to see there. Most importantly, please know Alex and I are really grateful that you give us your time and we are always working hard to repay you for that gift. So until November 1st, when we come back to you with something new, thank you. Thank you for listening. The Always On EM Podcast, hosted by Alex Finch and Vank Bellamconda.